Hey everyone, I am Carmen Rios, digital editor at Ms. and it is the United States of Women Summit this weekend in Los Angeles where we're based. So I am here with Kristen Rowe Finkbinder. Yes, you got yeah. it. Ooh, got it. okay. Yes. From Mom's Rising. Yeah, and I was obviously hoping I would remember to ask you before <laughs> we went live how to pronounce your name, but then I forgot. Um, but yeah, we're here. She is the founder of Moms Rising, which is a group of over a million members mobilized for women's rights, and the author of Keep Marching, How Every Woman Can Take Action and Change Our World, an amazing sort of, well, I guess that's sort of, we're ready to dive in. What I loved about the book is that it breaks down um, statistics and policies in sort of really easy to digest and understand ways um, and then it also immediately provides you with this like roadmap to how to take action on this issue and on you know whatever issue someone might be interested in and you sort of talk in here um, a lot about you know the inception of the book and how you were really inspired by what you saw at the Women's March you wanted to sort of help turn that moment into a movement um, and I'm sort of curious as to, you know, what was the journey towards the book? And especially, you've just done so much different work in your career as an activist. So I'm curious to hear sort of like, how did, how did you get here? What oh brought you to this moment? <laughs> that is a good question. <laughs> it starts generations ago. Ooh. Uh -huh. It starts generations like ago. Like a little campfire story. Yeah, it's like a campfire that. story. <laughs> and um, my great grandma, I'm not even kidding you. It really does start <laughs> generations ago. It's my mitochondria. My great grandma was the first president of the Rochester, New York chapter of Planned Parenthood near the end of Susan B. Anthony's time. Oh my and my God. grandma, who is still alive today, and these stories are in the book, in the choice chapter, actually. Yes. My grandma, who is still alive today, um, followed her in the presidency. She's 101 now. And my grandma still calls me up. What is up? <laughs> With what is happening with birth control? Did you know they're still trying to take birth control from people? Because she also has these stories of these crowds outside my great grandma's house, yeah. just pounding on the door, like pounding on the door, being so angry at my great grandma for talking about birth control nine zillion years ago. So my grandma kind of has this like Groundhog Day thing. So she's like, "This is still happening. Keep fighting." So that is part of the start. It started, you know, before I was born. <laughs> Before, so many people were born. Um, this is your contribution so to the family legacy. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is my contribution. I have to mail her a book. But, um, and we did an audio tape, which I'm super excited. So oh, awesome. if you want to. But, um, but this book in particular, I was so inspired by the winds, by the power, by the rising up that I'm seeing across the country yeah. that has been happening with Moms Rising members and people. There's a lot of this sort of wave of cynicism and of hope coming across the country at the same time, and they kind of crash into each other. So the beautiful, humbling, awesome part about writing <laughs> this book was writing in examples of how women have actually moved mountains recently. You know, yeah. even though we have a malignant Cheeto in the Oval <laughs> Office, we are making dramatic steps forward at the city and state level right now in real time. And so being able to share some of those stories has been really kind of fun and, you know, even restores my hope. And I've been working yeah, in totally. politics since I was 19, so awesome. it's a long time. <laughs> well, and what were some of the stories that, like, you feel like really impacted you the most? Like the stories you were most excited to share in the book? I love sharing about the fight to win health care, the Affordable Care Act in the first place, which was not perfect. The Affordable Care Act is not perfect, yeah. but it was better than what we had and, you know, added tens of millions of people to have access to health care coverage. But women took such dramatic action to make that policy pass in the first place. Our members alone took 600,000 constituent contact actions Amazing. just in the couple months leading up to the final passage. And then we saw women across America rise up more recently and save health care against all odds twice. Saved health care for 30 million people twice. And when you look at the statistics of who's been taking action, it's 86% women. So being able to share sort of this is where we were, this is what brought, you know, here's the fuel, the force that brought this policy forward, and here's the fuel and the force that saved it twice. Yeah. It was really fun. Totally. And, um, 
I liked in the beginning of the book where you said that this is also your way of getting your people, of pulling in, you know, well-intentioned people from a broad spectrum of identities and backgrounds to sort of build this intersectional movement. And the book definitely, you know, connects a lot of dots around gender justice, racial justice, and economic justice. Um, and you do also speak really openly about sort of your own blinders and the fact that we all need to be accountable and own up to the ways in which, you know, we need to do better at intersectionality. And so, you know, and we're here today as part of the United State of Women, which is obviously also about bringing all of these sort of powerhouses of female energy together. And how do you think we march on together from here? Like, what do you think that is going to look like? Oh my gosh. I think we are building a powerful, strong, leader full movement. You know, we are building a movement where we're, I think of it lately, I've been thinking of it like a garden. <laughs> like, where we're growing all of this power, literally. And it's so beautiful. It's like the most beautiful flowers you've ever seen. But they don't all look the same or act the same or be the same. And they don't all have the same necessarily issue that they're tracking or goal. Or, you know, we're building power for each other. And I've been thinking a lot lately um, and this is in the last chapter, but just really about intentionally lifting each other, mm. turning toward people who are being kind and doing good and lifting. There's so much good that can actually happen in terms of building real political power just by lifting other women in a conscious way. I was thinking about it. If we could each think like maybe once a day to lift another woman, <laughs> you know, whether she's running for office or you're backing her up as she's making calls on a public policy or you're, you know, backing her up in any way, shape, or form. So when you think about the movement, I think about a leaderful movement where women are lifting each other, and we don't all have to be working on the same issue at the same time. Yeah. And it's okay for us to have multiple issues. You know, I love the Audre Lorde quote, which sometimes I get a little backwards, but is <laughs> that we don't live single-issue lives, so we don't yeah. have a single-issue struggle. So just really respecting and being brave and making mistakes as we work to bend the arc of the universe towards justice is so important and it's a beautiful, powerful thing. So awesome. that's my long answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, and in your work with Moms Rising, um, what do you feel like you've really learned about, I'm always sort of interested in the ways that women so often lead movements, but then, you know, maybe history doesn't reflect our contributions and that women have this sort of unique way of, building and leading movements. And I'm sort of curious as to what you've seen from your members and your own work and even just, you know, your immediate sort of team at Moms Rising, like about the sort of unique role that women can play in this moment, but just like across the board in their communities and in politics. Like, what do you think is so critical about sort of, you know, this work of making sure women are equipped to be the leaders and growing that leaderful movement like what is it about women's work that is so key here one of the things that I love is a Harvard Business Review study that said that when groups of women get together the output of that group is higher IQ level than the any of the highest IQ levels of any individual <laughs> woman alone so that actually women coming together as a group are smarter than any one woman in the group and I see that happen all the time and we also know from studies that if you have diversity and women in leadership that you actually have better outcomes better yeah. solutions better ideas totally. that actually work better in real life <laughs> and if you're a corporation you make more money too you know we're a nonprofit, so we're not about that but i was like to throw that in because you know there's this giant glass ceiling i'm like actually you yeah, can be like, the by the way ceiling. there's an economic imperative yeah, yeah. yeah exactly it's not the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do. But so really taking the time to listen to each other and to understand that we all wear blinders to each other's experiences. So listening to each other and then figuring out, you know, who's being impacted the most in what ways and how we can rise together to address those issue areas or those policy areas or those struggles, I think is a joy you know, to be able to do. And it's an honor yeah. to be in a group of women and a team. I mean, really, this is not about me. This is about we. It's an honor to be in a group of women and a team who are just amazingly smart and have a lot of different perspectives. Yeah, I relate. I, yeah, I always feel like it's a, just like the ultimate privilege of doing professional feminism yeah. and having that be my day job is just, I work with this amazing, you know, crew of smart, intelligent, like very intelligent, gifted, 
ambitious women and everyone is also simultaneously like so kind and you I know. know yeah and so passionate and what are some of the ways that you've sort of um intentionally like intentionally pursued inclusivity and intersectionality in the work of Moms Rising? I think one of the things, well, we have key result areas and associated metrics at Moms Rising. <laughs> so we're like super intentional. We have it's a like, Monday, how wonky can we get? I know, like, <laughs> I'll assure you, you. We have a Monday metrics meeting at Moms Rising. Awesome. And we're looking at our metrics. So we have our mission statement, and then we have the annual organizational objectives, and we have the key result areas, and then the metrics. And so we are very intentional about what we're doing. So you are literally we're tracking your numbers. success yes. at building this intersectional yes. movement. Yes, awesome. in real time. So our membership actually does mirror the U.S. Census in terms of racial and ethnic composition. And we are still growing incredibly quickly. And so we're looking at this. We're looking at what policy areas are so important. And that's why it's critical that in that book, Absolutely critical. Some people are like, I cannot tell you the people who are like, why is this in the book at the beginning? Like, why is mass incarceration in the book? Why is fair treatment of all women and families in the book? I'm like, have you really paid attention here? The fastest growing incarcerated population in the nation are women. And we yeah. live in a nation where we have the highest incarceration rate in the world. And 50% of kids have been touched by an incarcerated parent, by impacted by an incarcerated parent. And then Two thirds of immigrants are women and children. I mean, it's just like, so being able to listen and to expand what we're working on instead of be like, hello, if you want to come, it is my way or the highway is so important. Yeah, and I love too that obviously like the, sort of the feel I got reading through the book is this idea that, you know, there are action steps people can take at whatever level they're yes. sort of ready to go. You know, if you want to run for office, that's in there. If you want to just start sharing your story, that's in there. And that is something, that's a question that I've gotten like my entire time that I've been doing activism is people sort of want to know, like, if I'm not ready or don't feel like I'm a good fit to do X, like how can I be of value? Like am yeah. I not just, am I just not of value to the movement, which of course you are. Everyone yes. can make their contribution. And I'm sort of interested in, um, you know, that if the intention here was to sort of empower people to see the different ways that they could take action, what have sort of the responses been so far to the book? Oh, people have loved that part. So many people are like, wait, I can make a difference in five seconds. And people <laughs> like, have to like quit their job sell their whole house, you know, in order to take action. And it's not true. So people can make a difference in whatever time they have and whatever way feels right for them. So I really, at first, actually, I, when I was writing the book, the first readers were like, Kristen, you started at PhD level. I'm like, here's how to run for office. They're like, wait, no, stop. And so now the first one is sort of understanding the first rule of organizing is believing you can win. It's so important. And then the second one is, figuring out what you personally care the most deeply about. That's the second sort of to-do and how to figure out how you can have the most impact and who can support you in that and all of that. And then it starts consecutively moving into the harder, longer term, you know, making more time out of your schedule types of activities. But it's true. Just making a phone call to a member of Congress can really totally. like change the world. And that's in there too. How to yeah. have, make the most effective phone calls. And I feel like more people need to realize that like if you have called your member of Congress this week, you've probably already done more yes. organizing and activism than a large share of the people like in your community or, you know, even sometimes who are passionate mm -hmm. about the same issues as you. It's like something that simple is something that so many people are, you know, that's a huge contribution. There's many of us who are not making phone calls yeah. or are too scared to make phone calls. And so, yeah, that everything counts and every contribution matters. Um, I have some sample scripts in there for making a call. Like you can like fill in the blank with your issue area. But, you know, here's what to say and you can leave a message. And here's the top question that I get. People always ask, you know, I live in a legislative district or a congressional district where that member of Congress really agrees with me already. So should I still make the call? The answer is yes, absolutely. When a member of Congress or a state legislator or city council member already agrees with you, then they use your calls to lobby their colleagues. So they'll be like, hi, I just got eight zillion phone calls. You person who is not voting yet in the right way on this, please make my phone stop ringing by joining me in moving this policy forward. And so it's super helpful even if you're a member of Congress or state legislator agrees with you. Make the call anyway. 
Yeah, thank or spank. I yes. feel like that's, yeah, that's the true thank and thank. That's yeah, awesome. like the. Well, you're getting to the important part. Thank or vote them out of office. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump was elected with 27% of the eligible voters voting in his favor, voting yes. Now, people are like, wait, don't you have to have 50% plus one? Well, not if what happens in 2016 happens again. What yep. happened is not everybody who was eligible to vote got registered to vote, and not everybody who was registered to vote voted. So we have this massive case of voter anemia in America, and I hope everybody watching right now, because women are the most likely to have problems with voter ID laws. So everybody right now, double check that you are registered to vote now, and then make sure before that it's you, too late. Before like, it's too late. And before the primary. Yes, yeah. and then um, and then register like everybody you know to vote, and remind them all to vote, and have a party on election day. Like bring a party with you to the ballot box. You know, if you go in, or you can have a party to vote together if you're right in. Um, yeah, make it fun. Well, and so you've talked about Donald Trump. And you've also touched on, you know, believing that we can win. And, you know, the sort of spirit of the book is so inspiring and hopeful. And so I obviously have to ask, like, how do you maintain your optimism and your sense that, you know, I think a lot of people right now feel very helpless and mm -hmm. sort of, um, and there are a lot of things happening right now that might take us a very long time to fix. Some judges come to mind. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, like, how do you sort of maintain your your hope in the arc of the universe still bending in all the right directions. I have like the incredible honor and privilege to be able to see change happening every day because Moms Rising is truly a million members strong. And so, for example, in the last month, I've seen Equal Pay Opportunity Acts pass in multiple states because women rose up. I've seen uh, policies at the state level pass to raise the age by which Children can be charged with crimes. Hello, that needed to happen 100 years ago, but at least it's happening now. I've seen another thing that needed to happen 100 years ago or actually never happened at all in the first place. Can't believe we're having to do laws about this, but stopping of shackling during delivery um, yes. happen in many institutions, but it hasn't happened nationally yet, so we have some work to do there. I've seen paid family medical leave pass in multiple states. I've seen so much positive change happen because Literally, women are making phone calls. They're going in to meet with members of Congress or the state legislatures. They're sharing their personal story about how the lack of these policies or these policies impact them, raising their voices. And so the joy in my life is that I think of myself and I think of Moms Rising, the Moms Rising team, is really opening avenues for busy people to be heard on the issues that they care about the most. And when people take those avenues and raise their voices, change happens. It doesn't always happen overnight. So that paid family medical leave bill that I talked to you about, that took over a decade. I literally yeah. worked on that bill for over a decade. So keeping, you know, I think about resist, persist, and insist. The persistence part is clearly key. <laughs> but wins do happen. Yeah, it might take a very long time. The ERA comes to mind that yes. we are, yeah. We had mm -hmm. a lot of people talking to us yesterday about the Equal Rights Amendment, which, yes. by the way, did not get ratified by Matt Glenn, just in case anyone else is confused about that. Yes. A lot of people do think that that happened. Um, well, and sort of, you know, coming off this momentum of the United State of Women, what do you think are some of the maybe like most important things that we can set our sights on for right now? You know, like mm -hmm. if it's a time right now of small and incremental steps, because mm -hmm. it's a time where we're fighting great odds. Like, what would you say are some of the ways people can distill the issues in this book down into, like, this is the, you know, this is the next step we all need to be taking? And mm -hmm. Well, I think we're actually ready for some giant leaps forward. I think that it was an incredible wake-up call, what happened mm -hmm. in 2016, and it was a moment in time where we had this wake-up call that we cannot fall asleep at the wheel of democracy. Democracy does not drive itself. In fact, when it is, Driving itself, it is disastrous, like the Tito of Doom. So we have seen so many people sort of do that triple blink and go, whoa, you know, my voice is really needed. It's not just powerful, but it is needed in order to create a future that we all need where more and more people have access to thrive. And so I think we're 
I, I don't think we're stuck in incremental steps forever. I think we're about to take some giant leaps forward. I'm really hopeful about the midterm elections. I'm hopeful about the next regular giant large elections and getting a new president. And I think that we're going to see some public policies passed at the federal level that have long been stuck and sort of stuck as partisan log jam area, like we'll probably, hopefully, knock on wood, everybody take bets. Eventually <laughs> have a paid family medical leave program nationally, like every other country in the yeah, world. Yeah, like it's a bad time. It yes. would be a bad time. Yes, and we'll probably, let's, we should take some bets. I'm betting <laughs> the Paycheck Fairness Act will finally pass. Not anytime in the next year or so. <laughs> Not with the current <laughs> configuration in Congress. But it's a lot of incentive for people to get out and vote that these policies are out there, they're ready to go. It's not rocket science how we can actually change our world for the better. We just need to have the political power and the political push. And that momentum is growing. And every time we pass a policy at the city and at the state level, it builds on that momentum at the federal level so that everybody has access to the same opportunities. So I, I'm not, I'm like the anti-cynical lady. I, I see a lot of hope. I'm like, it's infectious. There's yeah. a lot of optimism filling the yeah. library right now. Yeah. Um, well, and you know, we're coming up, and you touch on this in your book, and obviously just in your work in general, it's very obviously focused on moms. And I actually found it really interesting because, you know, I don't think that I've ever, um, like to see the wage gap broken down, not just by women by age, women by race, but to see the wage gap broken down as moms versus dads. And then to really dig into what that means for two mom families and single mom families. And, um, you know, this very unique focus that Moms Rising has too on moms and fighting for moms. Mother's Day is coming up yes. in exactly one week. And, you know, in the book, I love when you say that we have this country that purports to worship moms. We think, oh yeah, we're everything's about protecting mothers and you know, I almost said family. Roll. It almost happened right there. And almost obviously, <laughs> protecting mothers is great. It is when, good. It's not good when you say, "I would like to protect mothers." Smash! <laughs> like right now, we have that happening. By the way, if I'm yes. being on a soapbox, right now that is happening, where in Congress it is being proposed to take away SNAP, which is food stamps, yeah. which is ridiculous. Take food away from families to protect moms and their yeah. children. Yeah, that's not, yeah. Good. that's not good. Meanwhile, Donald Trump's family is getting $11 million in tax breaks, right? Like, this is <laughs> yeah. what I'm talking about, why the eye roll almost happened. Because I'm like, okay, people who are saying that they're protecting moms are often doing the exact opposite. Well, and yes. what can our viewers out there and you know feminist activists as they're gearing up for mother's day what are some actions they can take in the next week to support moms for real and not just as political talking points yeah <sighs> well first of all the um all of the proceeds of the book goes to moms rising so i'm that. hoping that people pick up the book they write in it. It looks like this. They tear out the pages <laughs> that they don't like because nobody's perfect. So there will be pages in there you don't like. Tear them out. I tear any out. Tear them out. <laughs> no, I, I, have like, I feel like I would love it I'm if like somebody I'm told me. It. If they tore some out, they were so mad they lit it on fire because that means that they're engaged with it. I don't want the whole book lit on fire. Just select pages. I'm like, comment below yes. with <laughs> photos of the pages you ripped out of the book <laughs> and the things maybe that you underlined. <laughs> yes, exactly. And the things you underlined. But be in conversation with the book and then and start a conversation totally. with other women. So for Mother's Day, we're starting Keep Marching Circles, which is people getting together to talk about the topics in the book, to lift one another up, like we were talking about awesome. in the beginning. So let's get together, we'll talk about the topics, we'll lift one another up, and we'll work on getting out the vote. And so when you give this book as a gift for Mother's Day, um, which we're hoping people do, then the proceeds go to Moms Rising, and you have an organizing tool. And then after you've ripped out the pages you don't like, you can pass it along to a friend, like a baton, as we build a stronger <laughs> movement. So I'm hoping for Mother's Day we take Take more steps forward and rising. Moms Rising was started in the first place with book discussion groups from the Motherhood Manifesto, which Joan Blades and I co-wrote. And a lot of people really enjoy getting together for those discussion groups. We're hoping that we have another. Oh, yeah. So everything is coming, yeah, coming full, full circle. circle. Yes, yeah. Like, well, it's time for another book because, you know, we've got this malignant Cheeto problem <laughs> and many things similar to the malignant Cheeto happening across the country. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, and so also, I guess, just what, You've been on this incredible journey now um, from activist to movement leader and now, you know, 
author of this amazing activist workbook. And so what's next for you? Like, how are you marching on? What are your, what are the sites you're setting for yourself and for, you know, Moms Rising and what's on the horizon? Well, first, each day I'm thankful that I work on the Moms Rising team. And this book would not happen like without learning from, listening to, and being part of the Moms Rising team. So we have to give a giant applause. Second, I think of myself as pushing from behind. You know, I'm really excited about starting more Keep Marching Circles across the country. We already have members in every state in the nation. And so deepening our engagement, our engagement levels have already deepened by threefold in the last year alone, and we're still growing really quickly. But deepening our engagement and really having that rising tide of change, I'm just excited to be part of the tide that's rising. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. And again, it's Keep Marching, How Every Woman Can Take Action and Change Our World. Give it for Mother's Day. Spend all Mother's Day in your room reading it. No, you lift your chocolate Ripping and things out of it. You can have your chocolate. Like, you can read it and eat your chocolate at the same time. That's true. Or read yes. it with your mom. Read it yes. aloud to your mom. I yeah. feel like there's a lot of options here. I can call my mom on the phone. Read her my favorite chapters. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, thank you so much for writing the book. Thank you so much for being here. And, yeah, like, let's let's keep marching. Yeah. Definitely keep marching. Thank, thank you, you for having me. Oh, my God, no. It was wonderful. Yeah. <sighs> Bye. I'm like, oh, no. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs>